it's, it's great to be here. I, I guess I, Wilson was telling me I was here 10 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. It seemed like it was just, just recently, but as you get older, the years start slipping by pretty quickly. So thanks so much for bringing me up here and uh, get to talk about a subject that I'm very interested in and um, very excited about, which is uh, new proofs for God's existence. People have been thinking about God's existence and arguments for and against it for thousands of years, and you might think that everything that could be possibly be thought about this subject has already been thought, but that's wrong. In fact, um, people are constantly coming up with new ideas and new perspectives, and right now is one of the most exciting times, I think, for that. I'm, I'm corresponding with some friends, actually just down the road here in Baylor, and it's like every week we're coming up with new twists on, on the arguments. Um, well, mostly they're coming up with it. I'm saying, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's an exciting time, I think, to be looking at these, these problems. Uh, so again, if you have any questions later, uh, there's my email address, my personal one. So UT isn't uh, snooping on that, I guess. So, so send me whatever questions you have. And uh, I've got a website where I post papers and things occasionally, which uh, some of which are not even published. So that's a good thing to look at. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make a distinction here initially between philosophical arguments and scientific arguments for God's existence. Uh, and then I'm actually going to talk briefly about both, but mostly about the philosophical, obviously, since I'm a philosopher, not a scientist. Um, so the, um, uh, there, there have been two sorts of arguments that I'm particularly interested in. Um, one is sometimes called the Thomistic, or sometimes it's called Leibnizian. So referring either to Thomas Aquinas or Leibniz, uh, you could call it the scholastic argument for God's existence, which has to do with the, the necessity of finding a first cause for all the contingent facts of the world. Um, and that's, a, we'll talk, uh, that's the main one I'm going to be talking about. Uh, there's also another tradition, which is called the Kalam tradition, which develops in, actually in uh, Christian thought in the late antiquity and then gets taken up by some Muslim thinkers and Jewish thinkers and then comes back into the Christian world a little bit later. And, and up until pretty recently, these were two quite separate ways of coming at, God's, at the question of God's existence. But in just in the recent years, there's been a kind of convergence of these two and, a, and an interesting inter, interaction between them. And so I'm going to sort of report to you some of that that's happening. I think again, it's quite exciting. And then I'll briefly mention some of the more scientific evidence that's out there. Because, um, again, I'm not a scientist really, but I do follow this stuff as best I can. Uh, evidence about the Big Bang and about the so-called fine-tuning of the universe. And I think that what I, what I hope to do is that by giving this philosophical background, the scientific evidence will sort of fit into place in a way that it can't do that if you don't have the philosophical background initially. So if you, if you try and jump into the scientific stuff initially, it's, it can be a little confusing. It's not, not quite so clear where it leads. Whereas if you have the philosophical framework there in place, then I think the scientific evidence will hopefully make a little bit more sense. Uh, so the, uh, the main in argument, as I said, that I'm going to focus on is uh, this Thomistic argument, uh, going back to uh, Thomas Aquinas in the uh, 13th century. Um, and so one of the great things about the age we live in is that uh, you know, the entirety of ancient and much of medieval literature is available you know, a click away on the internet, which uh, I remember when I was in school, I actually had to trudge over to a library and dig these things out of uh, obscure uh, de uh, um, stacks if I was lucky, right? Uh, but now it's all available, so you can look at that. And then um, I, I mentioned Alexander Proust at Baylor. He wrote a book called The Principle of Sufficient Reason back in 2010, which I highly recommend. It's kind of a state-of-the-art book on, on, on some aspects of the argument. Uh, he's also got a great blog, so just Google Alexander Proust. It will pop up. It's, I think it's the most popular philosophy blog in the world right now. Uh, and it's amazing the, the range of things that he covers in that blog. Um, uh, mathematics, decision theory, probability, God's existence, ethics, sex, so everything. Um, great book, great to read blog. Uh, and then some of my own work, um, including um, a uh, in 2008, and then a, an article I published just last year in, in News on the column argument. So I'll be mentioning some of that as well. So again, it's pretty cutting edge stuff, right? Recent stuff. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's an argument with a long history. I think it goes back 2,500 years. And what I think I think is very exciting about it is that you find the very, very similar arguments across cultures. So it's not something that uh, is unique or, or 
specific to Christian culture, let's say. You also find it in ancient pagan cultures, among the Greeks and Romans, in uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Indian. I've got a colleague who specializes in Indian philosophy, and we've done some collaborating and some talking about the parallels between 10th century Nyaya schools' arguments for God's existence and these, uh, uh, these other arguments. And it's quite stri striking, actually, uh, indicates that there's a kind of a logic here that uh, the human mind is, is naturally uh, uh, kind of key into uh, early modern European uh, history as well. So it's, it's had a long history, and um, it's, I think it's incumbent on us, in a way, just as educated people to understand this argument, because it's so central to, to understanding the, the history of civilization. Right? So, so uh, even, if you're not, even if you're not particularly interested in religion, I mean, you have to understand this argument so you can understand why people are building cathedrals in France and why Bach is writing the kind of music he's writing. Uh, it, all, it all reflects uh, the kind of philosophical background that, that we're going to look at tonight. Okay, so, so I'm going to try and keep it, um, keep it simple here if I can. So, you know, hold up your hand. Um, and let's suppose you've got five fingers or so, right? However many you have, right? Do you know that you've got a hand there with five fingers, right? Well, I think most of us would say that we do. Now, now if, if you're going to part company with me here and say, well, I'm not so sure about this hand thing and how many fingers there are, okay, I'm sorry, the argument's not going to work on you, right? Uh, so the argument is not going to uh, dis dispel every possible skeptical objection to everything, right? So if you're not willing to buy into the idea there's empirical knowledge, uh, I, I can't help you, right? So hopefully you're on board with me so far. And my claim is if you're, if you're on board with me so far, I should be able to persuade you that God exists, right? That's the, that's the, uh, the essence of my claim tonight. So very modest uh, project I'm going to try. Uh, so how, how does this work? Well, so your knowledge of your hand, I think, we might get into an argument about this actually, but I think basically it's a case of empirical knowledge. That is, it's, it's not something that you know by pure logic or mathematics alone, right? I can't, I can't sort of study Euclid's axioms and say, mm, yes, I must have a hand with five fingers. Uh, so, um, so what we know empirically, we know in, in basically four ways, right? Through our senses, through sense perception, uh, through memory, through testimony, very important source, right? Somebody tells me what they saw in Dallas uh, yesterday. Uh, and by things we can infer using scientific, or historical, or legal methods from the other kinds of empirical knowledge that we have. So those are, those are the basic four sources that we call empirical knowledge. And again, that's, that's in contradistinction to mathematical, logical, so-called a priori knowledge. Right? Um, now, all empirical knowledge, I think if you reflect on it a minute, you realize it depends upon this notion of cause and effect. Cause and effect is central to the idea of empirical knowledge. So if I perceive something through the senses, right, it's because we recognize that light is bouncing off of surfaces and we reflect it into our eye and causing changes in our eye, in our brain, in our mind. Right? That's, that's how, and, you know, even if we don't know the details, we know there's some kind of cause and effect story that connects us to the world that we're perceiving. Uh, memory, too, we think that there's some kind of causal connection, that somehow the fact that I just ate a chicken salad is somehow a cause of my present believing that I had a chicken salad, right? There's some, that, it, that my present memory is a, is a kind of effect of that experience, right? Um, testimony is obviously a chain of communication events. One person communicates to another that causes the person who hears the message to to take it up and then to pass it on to another person. Right? There's a chain of cause and effect. And likewise, scientific, historical, legal reasoning involves cause and effect. When you're doing scientific reasoning, you're either looking at effects and trying to figure out what their cause is, or you're looking at causes and trying to predict what sort of effects they'll have. Right? All of it, this cause and effect reasoning is just ubiquitous. It's everywhere in this kind of empirical knowledge. So if, here's my claim. Here, you know, here's the step, hand, right, light, eye, brain, knowledge, right? There's a cause and effect chain from left to right. And my claim is, look, if any of these steps could occur without a cause, if any of these things could happen causelessly, if you admit that's even a possibility, you've now undermined the very possibility of empirical knowledge, right? So, in other words, if it's possible for light to just causelessly come into existence, right, between me and you and enter into my eye and cause the various effects that I have, then if that's even possible, right, then I have to say, well, can I really know that, that this fellow has a blue shirt? 
Maybe blue light just sort of appeared in the medium between us, causelessly, without any cause. Uh, in fact, do I really know that my eye is there, right? I mean, how do I know that I'm not just a brain, right? That, that sort of popped into existence without a cause in the middle of the vacuum somewhere, right? And uh, is being affected as if it were perceiving things, right? So, um, so the very, even the thought that these things might occur without a cause, right, is going to undermine knowledge. Okay? I mean, I could, I could develop this a little bit further if you hold off some of this for the question and answer, but, but the basic idea is this, that to get, to get the idea of a probability going, you need to have some kind of a causal structure there, right? So if you, you might say, well, I think it's really unlikely that light would just pop into existence causelessly between me and you. And I have to say, well, unlikely given what, right? In other words, um, yes, it is unlikely, given the fact that light can only come into existence when it's caused in a certain way, right? And so the quantum mechanics tells us, given the way light is actually caused to exist, it's extremely unlikely that light is just going to appear spontaneously between me and you. But if I say, but, but wait a minute, maybe some things happen with no cause at all, right? Once you admit that, then you're outside the realm of probabilities altogether, right? Because if something could happen with no cause at all, there'd be no way to assign the probability to that, to that event. It might, it might never happen, it might always happen, it might be in between. Uh, it, there'd be no way to get a grip on the notion of probability at that point, right? You're outside that realm. And that means, so, so let me give you an illustration. So suppose that um, uh, I go out and I, I observe a bunch of uh, birds outside and they're all black. And I say, okay, so I, I conclude that they're all birds that that live in this part, this ecosystem are black, let's say, right? And then it turns out that I learn more about the probabilities involved. And in fact, the populations of birds in this area are such that 50% of them are not black, they're white, and because the causal mechanisms produce, you know, 50% black, 50% white. Once I learn that, I'm gonna say, okay, I guess, I'm, I guess I was wrong, right? That sample I saw was pretty unreliable given these underlying causal facts. And so I'm gonna withdraw my, my conclusion. Right? Now suppose that I'm in a situation where I say, gee, I see all kinds of events and they all obey some kind of law of gravity, right? Uh, things accelerate according to a certain constant, right? And then you tell me, well, actually the causal mechanisms are such that it's very unlikely that anything's gonna obey the law of gravity. Point, only 1% probability that it will obey that law. Well, if I learn that, then I'm gonna say, okay, I guess all this data I have is wrong. It can be not very reliable if the underlying mechanisms make it only 1% chance. Now you tell me, okay, in fact, here's the situation. The stuff that you're observing, sometimes it happens with no cause at all. So, so you, might, you might get events that match the law of gravity, you might get events that don't match it. There's no way to assign a probability to one or the other. Well, if that's, if that's the real story, then the data I see is totally unreliable, right? Because there's, there's no probabilities out there, right? The stuff that I see could have been produced by sheer chance, by, by an event with no causal background whatsoever. And if I admit that as a possibility, that is a, what we call in philosophy a defeater. Uh, it undermines the reasonableness of holding on to any claim that's based upon causation or probability. All those claims are undermined by the sheer possibility of things happening without a cause. So, um, so again, if, if, it, if it could happen that sensations right, could occur without a cause whatsoever, if that's ever possible, then it could be possible at any time. Right? Uh, and then there'd be no way to assign any probability to the fact that this sensation was supposedly caused by some actual event out there in the world. There'd be no way to assign a probability to that if it's possible that sensation could just exist with no cause whatsoever. So in fact, there's an interesting illustration of this. Um, I mean, suppose that, suppose that brains just like mine right now could be caused, could come into existence with no cause whatsoever. Right? So in, in the realm of possible events, there's events like mine where the brain is actually caused by an actual series of events, and so the brain, I'm, I'm right when I believe there's people listening to me right now, right? But then there's these other brains in the realm of possibility that just pop into existence with no cause at all, they're just like mine. And they think they're perceiving a room full of people too. They're all wrong, right? 
Now, what's, what's the probability that I'm one of those brains versus the probability I'm one of these brains? If things could happen without a cause, there's no way to assign a probability to those two numbers. So that would mean that I have absolutely no reason to be confident that I'm one of the real brains as opposed to one of the so-called Boltzmann brains, that is a brain that, that just appears out of nowhere for no cause whatsoever. And that fact's gonna undermine all of my empirical knowledge. All my knowledge based on sensation, all my knowledge based on memory, testimony, scientific inference, it's all gonna come crashing down unless I can believe that, unless I know somehow that some kind of universal law of causality is at work here, right? Now, so, um, so I think, therefore, that, um, let's see, how is this? Um, suppose, we suppose that we did have some empirical knowledge, but I'm claiming that that empirical knowledge is impossible unless we know that every step in that process necessarily had a cause. It's the only way to, to resist this defeater that would otherwise undermine our empirical knowledge. But we can't know that empirically, because that would lead to a vicious circularity, right? In other words, um, it, it's a presupposition of our empirical knowledge, so it can't itself be empirically known. So there must be some self-evident principle of, of reason that tells us that things have causes, right? necessarily have causes of this kind. So there's only one kind of thing that can stop this process, this, this process of reasoning from effects to causes, and that with, without, a, without threatening our empirical knowledge. And that would be if we could reach something that was obviously uncausable, right? That wouldn't threaten my empirical knowledge because my sensations are not obviously uncausable, so they must have a cause. The light between me and you is not obviously uncausable, so it must have a cause. The light bouncing off you isn't uncausable, so it must have a cause, and so on. But if I were to reach something that was obviously uncausable, well, then it's uncausable, right? <laughs> and so the fact that it doesn't have a cause is not going to disturb anything. Right? It's not going to undermine my empirical knowledge. That obviously uncausable thing, of course, is going to lie somehow beyond the horizon of our empirical knowledge. It's going to be the thing that we reach at the very end, perhaps, right? But it won't be part of, it won't be something from which we infer other things empirically. But it's so far out there, that horizon, that the fact that it doesn't have a cause doesn't threaten anything else. It doesn't threaten the web of empirical knowledge that would lead up to it, okay? So let's put it this way. Something is, let's say something is, is empirically proximate, okay? If it isn't obviously uncausable. It's not the sort of thing that couldn't be caused. And I think reason tells us with certainty that every evidentially proximate thing must have a cause. Not everything, absolutely, but just every evidentially proximate thing, everything that isn't obviously uncausable must have a cause. And if we don't know that, a priori, if we don't know that with certainty, all of our empirical knowledge is gonna fall apart. It's gonna, it's gonna be undermined, okay? Now, does absolutely everything have a cause? Well, if, if so, we'd have a problem, right? Because if absolutely everything had a cause, then there'd be no stopping point. And that would mean you'd either have to come around in a circle or you'd have to go out to infinity as a regress. This is caused by that, which is caused by that, which is caused by that with no, without any end. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna exclude the circular part right away. And we could get into that in question and answer if you like. But I think that's sort of obviously absurd to think that something could cause itself because in order to cause itself, it would both, it would both have to exist and not exist in the same way at the same time, right? And I think that's impossible. But what about the infinite regress, right? So, so now it looks like we've got two possibilities, right? One possibility says we do reach an uncausable thing as the first cause. The other possibility says, well, we have to have a principle of causation, but maybe it just keeps on going forever. Maybe everything has a cause, and there's no first cause. There's an infinite regress, okay? So that's going to be the crucial question, and I'm going to give you some arguments now. And this is where, this is where these two traditions are going to start interacting. So, so far, what I've given you is the sort of scholastic, Thomistic argument, and now I'm going to jump over to the Kalam argument, and I'm going to interact them. And I'm going to say that the Kalam argument actually gives us some good reasons now to think that the infinite regress possibility can be ruled out. We can rule that out, and that forces us to the first cause conclusion. Okay? How does that go? There's a, there's a couple of arguments I can give. And the first one is called the Grim Reaper. Okay. And this was, uh, this was discovered or invented by Jose Benedetti in 1964. I think he's still alive in, in Cornell. Uh, great, actually one of the unsung heroes of 20th century philosophy, I think. Uh, not, a, not a household word, but this book is one of the great books of the 20th century, I think. And um, it's full of rich examples of this kind. So the Grim Reaper problem is this one. Um, you've got, um, Grim Reapers, of course, are death, deadly things, right? <laughs> they, they bring about death. So, um, so we imagine a situation in which we've got an infinite series of Grim Reapers, okay? And we've got some poor victim, Joe, who's, or Fred, I guess Fred, who's gonna end up dead, let's say, in this process. 
So here's, here's, the Grim Reapers are basically mechanisms which will do, will do two things. They're assigned a particular point in time, each one, and at that point in time, they check to see if Fred is alive. If he's alive, they kill him. If he's dead, they do nothing, right? Because uh, they're happy he's dead, okay? So, so far, so good, right? Fairly simple. You can sort of imagine a mechanism like this. Sort of checks Fred's vital signs. He's alive, right? He's dead, fine, nothing, okay? They've got a scythe, right? So if he's dead, the scythe doesn't move. If he's alive, okay? Got the picture? Okay, now. There's an infinite series of these, okay? And they're each assigned a different time. So Grim Reaper number one is gonna act at one minute after 12. One minute after noon, exactly. Okay, that's when he's gonna check if Fred's alive or not. Grim Reaper number two is gonna check 30 seconds after noon. That's earlier than one, right? We're going backwards, right? Grim Reaper number two, 15 seconds after noon. Seven and a half seconds after noon, and so on ad infinitum. So there's no first Grim Reaper. There's only a last one, so to speak. Right? One is the last one, second to last, third to last. Get the picture? Okay. Now, what happens to Fred? Here's the question. Can Fred survive this gamut of, of Grim Reapers? Well, surely not, right? I mean, his death is overdetermined infinitely many times, right? There's no way he's going to get past 1201, uh, despite uh, with an infinite number of Grim Reapers that are trying to kill him, okay? So, so therefore, at least one Grim Reaper must kill him. Right? I mean, at least one of those scythes must swing. So let's say it's Grim Reaper number N who swings his scythe and kills Fred, because Fred was still alive at that time, and then Grim Reaper number N kills him. Contradiction, right? That can't be right, because in order for Grim Reaper number N to kill him, he's got to survive until 1 over 2 to the N minutes after noon to get to the Grim Reaper number N. To get that far, he's got to survive an infinite number of other Grim Reapers, right? which he can't possibly have done. So there's no way for him to reach any Grim Reaper, and yet some Grim Reaper must kill him, right? Uh, so we get a contradiction, right? And when, when, when philosophers generate these paradoxes, these contradictions, they're great because they tell us something, right? This cannot happen. Therefore, one of the assumptions we made that led to this contradiction must be false. It's what we call a reductio ad absurdum, right? And, and the argument here is, there's nothing about this story that's at all suspicious except for the infinite number of Grim Reapers stacked up in this way. That's the only weak link in this story. Therefore, it must be impossible. It must be impossible. Now, the nice thing about my situation is we don't actually need to pack them all into one minute, in fact. We can spread them out. We can have one Grim Reaper at 1 BC, 2 BC, 3 BC, 4 BC, and so on, right? So one for every period of time, and assuming they're now an infinite past. Same story, same problem. Right? And, and now we, let's forget Fred. So let's say that what the Grim Reapers do is they, they make a pronouncement that Fred shall die, right? And they sign it Grim Reaper number N, okay? And the, 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 the rule is if nobody else has made this pronouncement, you make it, right? But if somebody else has already made it, you don't make it. You just pass it along, okay? So again, will one Grim Reaper at least make the pronouncement? Of course, at least one must. But none can, right? Because if you say it's Grim Reaper number N who makes the pronouncement, what about N plus 1, N plus 2, N plus 3, N plus 4, right? They, they must have done it already. Right? So, so again, we have a contradiction. And that suggests then that what must, you know, there's nothing wrong about the individual Grim Reaper stories. Check if he's alive, right? Check if the announcement's been made. If it has, do nothing. If it hasn't, make a pronouncement. That's perfectly possible, right? So the only weak link in the story is the possibility of an infinite regress. Right? So this story gives a very powerful argument for saying there cannot be infinite regresses of this kind. And if there can't be infinite regresses of this kind, we're forced to the first cause conclusion. Um, so again, that's, that's what I said. So, so infinite causal regresses must be impossible. Um, here's another, actually, let me go back to this one. Here's a new argument. This is like, Two months old, right? And so, and, it's a, and it, 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 it supports the very same conclusion, but it's really a kind of cool, interesting argument. If infinite regresses were possible, according to Alexander Proust, it would be possible for something to depend on an infinite number of probabilistically and causally independent causes. So if I could have an infinite regress, I could just set it up such a way that there are, instead of grim reapers, there are coin tosses at each of these periods, right? And each of the coin tosses are, are causally and probabilistically independent, and they all sort of sum up to some ultimate grand conclusion, 
at the end of the whole process, right? So now the Grim Reapers are just flipping coins or, or just throwing dice, right? And, and, and there's been an infinite number of them, and they all, their, their, their causal influences are all sort of culminating in one big event. That, that's the picture. And the argument is going to be that's impossible. Because if that could happen, we would get something called an infinite fair lottery. And infinite fair lotteries are obviously contradictory. So therefore, again, this infinite regress must be impossible. OK, so how does that work? Well, um, there's some technical issues here. Maybe I'll skip over these. But basically, if, if you use some of the basic assumptions of set theory, um, but let me put it this way. So, so suppose each Grim Reaper is throwing a 10-sided die. And so they get, a, they get a digit from 0 to 9, right? And they all do this, OK? So now we, what we do is we take, we take the uh, decimal expansion of a real number. So we take 0 point dot, 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 dot. We get, we get a digit from each of the Grim Reapers, right? So we get this infinite, possibly non-repeating uh, decimal expansion, which picks out a unique real number at random between 0 and 1. And then, it's, and then, again, if I make a few fairly uncontroversial mathematical assumptions, if you can pick a random real number between 0 and 1, you can actually turn that into a picking of a random natural number. That is, a number that goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, out to infinity. You can actually pick an, a random number, right? And that, and that will turn out to be impossible, right? So uh, let, me, let me just jump to that. Uh, here's Bartha's paradox. So suppose, suppose that we've got two chains of Grim Reapers, right? Grim, one chain gives me a random number, another chain gives Nick a random number, okay? So I get my random number, okay? So it's, it's some number from one to infinity, okay? And I look at it, I think, well, that's a really big number, but you know, it's actually an incredibly small number because there's only finitely many numbers that are smaller than this. And there's infinitely many numbers that are bigger. Wow, that's incredible. I got an incredibly small number. Ned, Nick is his number. He's going to think the same thing, no matter how big it is. He's going to say, wow, it's amazing if my number's so small. And so now we ask, I ask myself, should I, suppose, suppose there's a contest to who gets the biggest number, right? And I think, gosh, Nick must have a bigger number because mine's incredibly small. And he's next going to think, no, Rob must have a bigger number because mine's incredibly small. And so we'll actually, we'll both be willing to pay somebody to get us to switch numbers. In fact, I'll say, Nick, I'll give you a dollar to switch numbers. He'll say, no, I'll give you a dollar to switch numbers. And so that can't be rational for both of us to do that, right? Uh, and so there, if you assume that, that you can't have a situation in which rationality itself becomes self-contradictory, when two different opposing actions both become irrational, right? If you assume that's impossible, then infinite fair lotteries must be impossible. But if infinite fair lotteries are impossible, then infinite regresses must also be impossible, right? So it's a whole new argument, I think, confirming in, in a new way uh, the, uh, the result that, uh, yeah, here's another good example, right? So suppose, suppose that I get my number, and uh, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm gonna play the following game, right? Um, if, if my number is bigger than so I'm going to play an infinite number of games, okay? One for one, two, three, four, for each number, right? If my number is bigger than that number, I win. If it's smaller, I lose, okay? Well, obviously, I'm going to lose infinitely many of those games and only win finitely many, right? And yet, when I'm considering whether to play these games, and I'm considering I'm going to, the Grim Reaper is going to give me a random number, right? Now I should play the game, right? Because it's really going to be a random number, so it makes sense for me to play the game, even though I'm going to lose infinitely many of the games and win only a finite number. So that's, that's obviously absurd. OK, so the only way to block those is to assume that the infinite uh, regresses are also impossible. Let me go back to this slide I skipped. Yeah. Um, here's another way, at least two other ways, maybe, maybe the same way, to also block infinite regresses. Because, so it, suppose you don't buy those arguments of Lee Shig, right? And you think, okay, I still think infinite regresses are possible. I'm going to say, fine. Even if infinite regresses are possible, they're still going to need a cause, right? If they are made up of causable things. If they're made up of contingent things that each individually need a cause. The whole regress needs to have a cause. Here's uh, the Proust uh, cannonball example, right? So suppose a cannonball is shot from a cannon, and the cannonball crushes the wall of the castle, okay? Now, suppose I were to say, you know, the cannon had nothing to do with that, right? It's only the cannonball, which out, without any cause, it's crushing the wall of the castle. Here's my argument. So the second half of the path of the cannonball is caused by the first half, or the, the, let's say the second half is caused by the 
the next quarter. That quarter is caused by the eighth before that, the eighth before, caused by the quarter before that, and so on. So I keep, I keep explaining later parts of the path of the cannonball in terms of earlier ones. I get smaller and smaller ones, so there's an infinite regress. I never get to the cannon. I stop long before I get to the cannon, right? And I say, that's it. You don't need a cannon. I've explained it all just by an infinite regress of, of cannonball paths, right? But that's obviously absurd, because even if you do break the cannonball paths into those smaller and smaller pieces, you still got to know, ask, well, what got the cannonball going in the first place? I mean, the whole regress needs a cause of some kind. And that's actually very much what Scotus and Leibniz and uh, others in the Middle Ages figured out, which is take all the causable stuff in the universe, put it together. Does it need a cause? Yes. Can its cause be causable? No, because if, it, if the cause of it were causable, then we'd have a circular causation. Something would be causing itself. Therefore, there must be something uncausable that causes all the causable stuff, right? So a fairly simple argument that I think, again, should be persuasive. Okay, so you might say, fine, whatever, right? So you've got the conclusion that there must be a first cause. Maybe you get the conclusion that it's gotta be sort of obviously uncausable thing. How does this relate to God or you know, all the, all the theological questions, right? Seems pretty abstruse at this point. So we've got to ask ourselves, well, what would an uncausable thing be like? Well, if we look at, at how cause and effect works, right, what we find is that causable things, the things that we can perceive or remember or infer in, in ordinary science, are variable things, they're inconstant things, they're changing and changeable things, right? And, they're, and, and so, it seems we can, we can extrapolate that an uncausable thing would have to be constant, unvariable, right, unchangeable, invariant in some way. Um, so if it's uncausable, I'm going to argue it has to be infinite because if it were finite in any respect, so if the first cause, suppose the first cause had a certain amount of mass, right, 10 to the 100th ergs of mass or something like that, right? That's obviously a causable fact. Why just that much? Why not a little bit more, a little bit less? It's causable, right? Whereas if you say it's got, it's got a mass that's just immeasurably vast, it's not so obvious that that's causable, right? I mean, now, now we're off the charts. We're not in the realm of, of things where cause and effect really makes sense. Or if God, had a, if God had an intelligence of a zillion IQ, right, you could say, well, why not a zillion plus one or a zillion minus one? You would look for a cause of that fact. But if you say God's just infinitely intelligent, he's perfect wisdom, not clear what, what a cause of that could possibly look like. And if that's so, then, then we're sort of pressed towards the idea that um, in order to be infinite in every respect, something would have to be a case of, of what the medieval philosophers like to call a case of absolute existence. So it's a thing that, that exists without any limitations whatsoever, without any kind of boundaries to it whatsoever. Because if it had any kind of boundary or limitation, you could ask what caused that limitation or that boundary. Or if it's simple absolute existence, you can, you can reach a point of uncausability, obvious uncausability. Now, could there be two such first causes? Well, no, because if each one is, is an instance of absolute existence, right? Then if they're each identical to existence itself, then if there were two, they'd have to be identical to each other. So you couldn't have the two. Um, similarly, it's gonna have to have all possible power because it's gonna be the cause of all possible beings. The whole idea is that everything that's caused has to be caused ultimately by one of these uncausable things. And therefore that uncausable thing has gotta have unlimited power so that it can be the cause of all possible things. And if it's got all possible power, it's going to have all possible attributes to the maximum degree, wisdom, goodness, and so on. Okay, so that's the philosophical stuff. Now, how am I doing? Um, yeah, so okay. So now, now, let me, now let me switch to the scientific evidence real briefly and kind of slot that into the philosophical framework that we now have. Okay? So now we've got at least some indication that there's an uncausable first cause of everything that's infinite, that's maybe a case of absolute existence, right? What is that? How does that fit with our current scientific knowledge? Well, as you know, in the last hundred years or so, we've discovered that the universe had a kind of, had a beginning of some kind, right? If you, if you wind the, the tape backwards, you reach a point where, at least in theory, the density of matter and energy would be infinite, right? You can't, you can't get to that point or certainly can't get past it. So it looks like there's some kind of a beginning. 
Um, as Robert Jastrow points out in his book on the astronomers, this conclusion was resisted fiercely by astronomers in the 20th century because they thought it was too theological. They, they said, I mean, he quotes them saying, that sounds an awful lot like Genesis 1, we don't want to go there, right? So, so there was a resistance to it because they realized that it did fit nicely with this picture of a first cause of, of the uh, contingent world. But despite that resistance, the evidence just kept, kept pouring in in support of the Big Bang model. Right? The redshift of the galaxies, the leftover cosmic radiation, so that now there's a pretty widely agreed that the universe had to have a beginning 13.7 billion years ago. If it had to have a beginning, it had to have a cause, and that gets us back, and that fits in nicely with the picture of a first cause. Now, in recent years, some physicists have proposed theories of a kind of pre-Big Bang era. So maybe the Big Bang isn't the absolute beginning. Maybe there's some kind of quantum foam or whatever before the Big Bang. But in 2003, a theorem was demonstrated that showed that every so-called inflationary model of the universe, even if our Big Bang isn't the absolute beginning, it has to have an absolute beginning. You can't go back infinitely far in, in time. So my point is that physics is actually confirming the result that philosophers have come up with independently, which is that infinite regresses of, of causation are impossible. Right? Physics have produced empirical confirmation of that same conclusion. So again, we're getting multiple strands of evidence and argument that are converging on the same idea of, a, of an absolute first cause of what's going on. Now, could the, first, could the Big Bang itself be uncaused? Well, I say no, because it's obviously not, it's not an obviously uncausable event, right? because it has all kinds of contingent features. It's, it's a, just a certain amount of entropy, right? A certain amount of, uh, of wobbliness and, and a certain and so on, right? So there, there are specific, finite features of the Big Bang that call out for some sort of explanation. So it's not going to be the, the first, the Big Bang. Moreover, and this goes back to my earlier point, suppose you thought that the Big Bang was uncaused, right? Then would we have any reason to think that the Big Bang is uniform across space? Well, no, right? If it's uncaused, then the part of the Big Bang that we've seen so far, which has expanded into our visible universe, is going to be just a little part of the Big Bang. No reason to think the rest of the Big Bang is like it at all. The rest of the Big Bang could be the kind of stuff that produces dragons and Hogwarts magic and magical beasts and who knows what, all kinds of crazy, insane stuff, right? You can't rule it out if, if it's all just brute fact that's uncaused, right? You can't even judge how unlikely that is. The probabilities would make no sense in this context. And that would mean, again, that our empirical knowledge is totally fragile because dragons and Hogwarts beasts could be zipping in from the horizon right now, right? From that part of the Big Bang we haven't seen before and completely screw up all of our scientific generalizations. We don't believe that, right? We believe the Big Bang is uniform somehow, but in believing it's uniform, it's because we believe that it has some common cause. That's the only way that you can justify that kind of assumption of, of, uh, of uh, uniformity. So, my overall point here is theistic metaphysics is not a competitor to science, empirical science. Quite the contrary. If you don't buy into theistic metaphysics, you're undermining empirical science. The two actually are, they grew up together historically, culturally inter interdependent, and they're intellectually and philosophically interdependent as well. If you start saying, oh, this, big, this first cause stuff, I don't think I'm going to go. I just don't buy this causality principle. That's going to be big, big problems for your theories of empirical science. So be careful about going that way. Now, what about the design argument? Well, once we have a first cause in the picture, right, as the cause of the universe we see, right, and then if we look at the universe that we see, we find it's organized, it's ordered to certain purposes, like stars and planets and carbon and all that, right? then it's very reasonable for us to assume, for us to infer that the first cause has intelligently produced these results, right? If, 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 if there's fine tuning of the constants in order, to make, in order to make stars and planets and carbon and the rest of the stuff possible, it's reasonable to assume then, or reasonable to infer that the first cause itself must be intelligent. So we can look at the elegant laws of nature, we can look at the, the fine tuning of the constants of nature, um, so across all the possible values those, those constants could take, they fall in these very narrow bands in which life is possible. That suggests that the first cause has intelligently selected those, those values to fit in those bands, those bands. Again, I'll just sort of skip over this for uh, reasons of time. Yeah, I'm not going to go through. So I'll, 
uh, I'm just going to skip over the kind of coincidences tonight. I'm not, again, it's not really my area of expertise. You should bring Robin Collins in from, uh, um, or, or someone who knows this stuff better. So I'll just skip over it. But the point is, there are constant, there are, there are coincidences about the, the organization of the basic constants of our universe that strongly suggest uh, an intelligent uh, agent. So uh, Fred Hoyle, who's not a theist, uh, said, you know, at least a common sense interpretation of facts suggests that a super intellect is monkeyed with physics. And he ends up rejecting that, but I think he's wrong because exactly once you get the first cause in the picture, right, this common sense interpretation becomes the right interpretation. It becomes the almost irresistible interpretation, right, because you've got the first cause, you've got these results that look like they've been monkeyed with to produce certain results. That's exactly when we infer that there was an intelligence that monkeyed with things in this way. So I think it's perfectly uh, reasonable, and so I, we can go over some of these in, in discussion if you'd like to, to, fill, to uh, fill, fill this in a little further. Uh, what about the multiverse hypothesis? Let me say a few things about that. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting that this at least concedes there's something important here to explain, right? That, there are, that these coincidences need an explanation, and the explanation is there's zillions and zillions of universes, so at least one by chance will be life permitting, right? So now at least, you know, the, the situation has changed, right? A uh, hundred years ago, the, uh, the agnostics, the skeptics were the ones saying, you know, we, we agnostics stick to the empirical facts and you theists are going to these metaphysical flights of fancy and postulating all this strange stuff, right? Now we've got the theists saying, well, we think there's still a first cause. The scientists are saying, well, we think maybe there's an infinite number of unobservable universes, right? And that sort of explains, well, okay, things have changed a little bit, right, in terms of metaphysical flights of fancy. At least, at least there's a more parity now than there, as there was before. Um, so that's one thing to note. Another thing to note is that the models that produce these, that build these universe-producing machines, they turn out to be fine-tuned as well. And so in the end, you just, you just shift the problem back a step. It hasn't really solved the fine-tuning problem. And then finally, and this goes back to my earlier theme, if you decide I'm going to embrace a really, really radical kind of multiverse picture. So every possible universe really exists. And now there's no problem. I mean, obviously in that, in that realm of all possible universes, there's going to be at least one life permitting one, right? But that is going to totally destroy empirical knowledge, right? Because now the Boltzmann brains are going to outnumber my brain a zillion to one, right? There's going to be far, far more brains out there that just pop into existence in the middle of nowhere, thinking that they live in a world like ours and then dissolve again. There's far, far many more of those than there are brains like ours that are actually connected to a really unlikely and probable universe like the one we're in. So that's, again, you know, you're, you're, if, you, if you want to avoid this conclusion that badly that you're willing to completely destroy empirical knowledge, okay, I can't, I can't block that move, but that seems like an overreaction of <laughs> some, some kind right, at that point. Okay, so again, let me, let me explain how I think this makes a difference to the design argument. So this is the sort of classical William Paley design argument, right, that David Hume discusses. You, uh, you look at the cosmos, you look at human artifacts, you think, gee, there's a kind of resemblance here between the uh, artifacts and the cosmos. We know that human designers cause the human artifacts, therefore we infer there must be a designer who caused the cosmos, right? The problem, of course, is that that inference is pretty weak because, yeah, there's some resemblance between the cosmos and the artifacts, but there's also lots of things in which they're not similar. Artifacts are really small, the cosmos is really big, and so on, right? And so, and also, you don't want this, you know, the, the danger of this argument is it's going to get you a really anthropomorphic designer who's just like human beings because that's the whole idea, it's an analogy, right? So that's a fairly weak argument. Now, here's the classic cosmological design argument of someone like Thomas Aquinas in the fifth way. Now, we've already got a first cause, right, by the argument I went through before. So we're not inferring a cause of the cosmos. We already got a cosmos, cause of the cosmos. Now we observe that the cosmos resembles human artifacts in being ordered to certain ends. There's complexity that's all ordered to a single simple end. That's just the sort of thing that we use to attribute intelligence to makers in the human case. Therefore, there's good reason to, to attribute intelligence to the first cause. So you're not, you're not sort of introducing the first cause. You've already got the first cause. You already know it's not like us. It's uncausable, it's infinite, it's absolute existence, and so on. You're just saying that somehow it resembles us in terms of intelligence, because its effects are, in that respect, resemble our effects when we're intelligent. And so that's a much stronger inference, I think. It, 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 it also blocks 
the Richard Dawkins who made God kind of objection, right? Because we know nobody made God. <laughs> We've already established that the first cause. It's uncausable, right? And so there's no, there's no worry here about, uh, about that, that problem. Okay, so I already talked about that. It avoids, avoids that problem. Uh, it starts with the cause. It, just, it, it, it already supplies facts about God. So we don't need to worry about God being infinite, immaterial, eternal, maybe even wholly good. That's all, got, that's all given to us by the first cause argument. So the, the design argument doesn't have to do that for us. It just has to give us intelligence wisdom. Right? So it's a much, much more focused argument. Um, okay, end with just two objections and then we're, we're done. We have some questions. So um, one standard objection to this is that, look, the, the uncausable first cause itself is, is impossible because it's gonna have to be a necessary existence, right? If it's gonna be uncausable. It's gotta be something that just exists by itself in a way that couldn't be caused and therefore must necessarily exist. And I think that's right. I think the first cause must necessarily exist. There's nothing it could be contingent upon. And David Hume says that's obviously impossible, right? And you're, you're assuming that it's possible to make the argument work. And my response is no, we don't assume that it's possible. We prove that it's actual and therefore possible. So there's no assumption here of possibility that's involved in the argument. And I, I just respond to him and say, look, the fact that you can, th you think, well, first of all, it's not all that easy, I think, actually to imagine what it would be like for God not to exist. It's actually harder to do than you might think. But even if you could do that, that's at best a kind of fallible indicator that God might not exist. It isn't conclusive. And the argument now provides us with conclusive reasons to think that he's necessary. And so, and so I think that, that beats uh, Hume's objection. And then you might say, well, doesn't quantum mechanics, mechanics teach us that some events are uncaused? And I think, no, it doesn't, in fact. Um, it teaches us some events are not determined in every respect. And so we have to make a distinction here between causation and determination. And that actually turns out to be really important anyway for the theist, because at least classic theists want to say that the creation itself is not necessary. So God's existence does not determine that a, cause, that a cosmos exists. It causes the cosmos, but it causes it in a contingent way, just as the uranium atom causes its decay, decay in an indeterministic sort of way. So actually, the quantum mechanical picture of causation fits very nicely with the theistic argument. It's not in conflict with it whatsoever. <clears throat>